Hi, I'm Susan, and welcome to my channel, Susan Stanley St Stitch in Time. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so glad you're here. On this channel, you know I like to talk about historic needlework, cross-stitch, quilting, antique textiles, sewing notions from the past, methodology of sewing from the past, all kinds of interesting topics. Today is a very, very special episode. I'm going to tell you about the project that I've been waiting to unveil, um, I finally am going to share it with you today and I can't be more excited. And I'm also celebrating a huge um, subscriber bump and I'm just beyond thrilled. Thank you so much to all of you who subscribe and comment. I really couldn't be more, more delighted to have that time with you and interact with you and, and just, uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Today, we're going to look at a whip, a finish, a purchase. We're going to take another peek at thread papers, and then I'm going to tell you about this project that I've been just bottled up, in, that's been bottled up inside of me. I've been waiting to share, and we're going to have a little celebration of reaching 5,000 subscribers. So let's get going. All right, the first thing I want to share with you is my whips are my whips, cross stitch whips. And if you've been watching me, you know I've been working on Hannah Lancaster. Earlier episodes give you a lot of details about this chart and what the process I went through in decide selecting threads and linen. I've, I've said earlier in a, an earlier episode, I'm being really deliberate this year. I'm really being careful about picking combinations of fiber and floss that really make my heart happy, that really work for me, that make the project um, something that I enjoy every stitch and I'm not pushing myself to finish because I don't really like it, but I wanna finish it. And that's what's happened with this project. Now I picked um, a Vera Soie. I did a conversion to Soie Delger and I'm using Fuller's Teasel Linen. And here are the flosses. And here is my progress so far. I didn't have a ton of stitching time this week. Let's see if I can get that up there. Because I was getting ready for this big announcement. But uh, this is comfort stitching at this point, stitching in that dress. And I've noticed that if I stitch across and then go back and stitch across on the dress, I get a better, I like the way the threads lay a little bit better. Uh, there's a, a better nap or, or just, you know, maybe it has to do with the twist. I don't really know. I'm hoping to get uh, the bottom third of it done and maybe the middle third this year, I don't know. And then the top third, you know, probably into next year. So this is definitely a long-term project. She's, you know, it's a large sampler, and I do, I have my, my fingers busy doing lots of other things. So she's not the only thing that I'm stitching. But I've enjoyed doing the grassy mounds, the tree, which is very mm, tone on tone almost. It's a t almost a textured look, like a brocade, this tree over in the corner. I considered changing that color and making it a little bit darker, but I think I like it. I like having, I can't really say it's ghosting, but I like elements that really are bold and then, and a little bit softer. So, of course, I had to jump, you know, if you follow me, you know I jumped right to the girl and the dress. I'm, that's really what I wanted to stitch. Now, is that, am I going to want to stop after I get her done? I, I don't think so, because the house is motivating, and I will go up enough into the the sampler so that I get some of the words stitched before uh, I leave. I don't leave that all to the end and hopefully I'll get to the border. So she's still somebody, this is still something I want to work on at least, at least seven days a month, you know, maybe more. I would love to work on it every day, but like I said, I have my hands busy with a lot of things. Um, the other project that I've been working on is my pin pillow that I'm stitching. It's a Mojo Stitches chart 
And I am stitching this on 5360 count after my visit to the attic. This is waffle cone linen. It's an uneven weave, which is going to change the shape and the, the well, it's going to change the shape of the final product project. I'm using these two Swasserfine threads. There's just a very slight difference and I've just made a little bit more progress. It doesn't look like a ton of progress, but actually inside, let me make sure I'm getting here into the camera. In the bottom of that basket and then up into the, well, the urn, I guess, uh, those are all eyelet stitches. So that's on 5360 count using Swasserfine. And I considered not doing those eyelet stitches, but once I got on a roll and started stitching them, um, I actually really enjoyed the texture that it, that it brought. You can't really see on a, on a different count linen, um, some other projects I've done like the old Scott, the eyelet stitches are much clearer. These aren't as clear and it could be my technique because I have not stitched on this high count linen with Swasserfine doing a specialty stitch like that before. Uh, but anyway, I like it and, and I'm gonna keep going even though it slows me down a tiny bit. Um, anyway, I got, you know, I'm trying to do a couple of threads at a time and not tire my, my eyes out. I'm actually enjoying it. Like I said, I, I don't know why Katie Strachan and I have talked about this and I know she mentioned it on her floss tube. I'm not sure why, but I can see this and I, like I said before, I have eye issues. So I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm kind of the type of person that likes to try different things. Even, even if they don't work out, at least I gave it a shot and, and tried it. So, all right, so that, those are my whips. And uh, like I said, I have been busy working on this project that I'm going to share with you. I did finish completely my Civil War Bride block and I got those little birdie feet done. And oh my goodness, they, I used on the, I used Appliquick. And if you're not familiar with that, if you are a quilter, an appliqueer, you might, want to look that up, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to, okay, two things. The thread, the, the fabric was not a very tight weave. So I knew to needle turn that and I probably should have picked a different fabric initially, but I liked the color. To needle turn that would have been really painful because I would have been pulling threads out of the weave and it might have turned under nicely, it might not have. and. So I, I tried Appliquick and I'm, I'm very pleased. Very, very pleased. So that block is done and I'm ready, getting ready to prep another block. I do need to add some embroidery to the eye and there's not a whole lot of embroidery on this entire quilt, but I think some embellishment will be really nice. Now, if you haven't seen me talk about this quilt before, this is part of a quilt called The Civil War Bride, or The Lost Groom, or The Bird of Paradise Quilt. There's several names, and it is a quilt that is survived from that time period and is in um, the American Folk Art Museum. It's very unique, very unique quilt from that time period. It has a lot of applique, very densely covered with applique, kind of in a I guess an homage to Baltimore album, but it's not a Baltimore album. You'll be hearing more about it because this another long-term project seems to be the way I operate. I, I like long-term projects, I really do. Um, I like finishing things, but I'm really a process person and if I'm enjoying the process of the project, it keeps me going, it motivates me, I'm just, just fine. I had to purchase something because it popped up and I think Brenda on Brenda and the Serial Starter shared this and I was not able to get the threads but it's Jane, oh I should take it out of the plastic, sorry, I meant to do that ahead of time. It is uh, my first, no actually it's not my first, it's, it's uh, a purchase I made from The Wishing Thorn 
and this has been available for some time, but because of my focus this year on 1840, I, I thought, you know, this one's just perfect. And what really appeals to me is stitching this in wool. And um, Birgit, Birgit, I'm so sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. The designer of this project is offering wool thread packs. And that would have been something that in 1840 someone would have stitched on. Now, you know, my marking sampler, I stitched that with goblins on 32 count because I wanted to emulate that experience of a young girl stitching in 1840. Well, in 1841, goblins, a thicker, you know, a wider floss or a wool would have been used. So that, that's my next adventure. So I've got that ready, um, waiting for her to get the wool wool threads in and then pick my linen so I can get started on that. So I'm, uh, I'm hoping to have at least a finish on my little tiny before I start that, but we'll see. Um, all right. Everyone was so excited about the thread papers last time. I can't tell you how much enthusiasm there has been based on those thread papers. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out episode 33 where I talk about thread papers and early ways of managing silk and, lin and uh, wool and linen floss for embroidery and handwork. Um, because I have been covering a series on work baskets and here is my thread paper packet that I put together for my work basket. And of course my marking sampler goes in there and you know, I'll be filling this with all the items that, that would have been in an early work basket. So I had done a lot of research and a lot of reading and one of the blogs that I gleaned so much information from was Two Threads Back. Well, a lot of you commented and had, you know, so much interest and I did get a comment from Katie Strachan and she recommended that I get this book. Now I purchased my copy off of Thrift Books and it did not come with the protective um, sleeve case that this originally came in and the protective case is beautiful. I didn't pay anything for this. I mean, it was just nothing. But I wanted to get a copy. It, the, the photo plates in here are absolutely gorgeous. It's an, a beautiful, beautiful record of early embroidery. But it does have a section on page 78 where it talks about and I believe that would be pronounced torch now I could be wrong but basically it says that a torch is a sheaf of gold or silk thread cut into sewing lengths held by a roll of paper or parchment slightly shorter than the sewing lengths then tied with a small cord one pulls out a length of thread with the point of a needle as needed. It's very similar, if not the exact same thing, as thread papers. And notice when this was written. So, 1770. I, I was very, very excited to have yet another reference and source for that information on thread papers. Now, I am going to put in... The, oh. And there is a blog, okay, so I'm gonna put in a video here, but there is a blog, that another blog I'd like to refer you to, and it's called Felting and Fiber Studio, Felting and Fiber Studio, and I will link that below in the description box. There is, she has a post um, where she talks about wash silks from Brainerd and Armstrong Company and she talks about a case that she found at a yard sale and it was full of these thread papered silks. Amazing. It's amazing. It's well worth looking at. And I wanted to show you, uh, because now that I've gone and done a little more research, I looked, I thought, you know what, I have 
I have a silk cabinet, it's like a thread cabinet from a general store, but it was for silks. I'm not completely sure how the inside was laid out in uh, the original setting. You'll see from the video, I've used it as, it as a, a place to display fun sewing notions and old buttons and things like that. But it does have two drawers at the bottom. And I thought, you know what? I bet those drawers were set up for thread papers. And I went over there and it was almost like Cinderella putting on her glass slipper. I stuck the thread paper in this little channel in the drawer and it was like, oh my goodness, it's a perfect fit. It's amazing. It's amazing. So let me put this video in here. The cabinet is um, Brainerd Silk Cabinet and I, I bought it because of course, you know, I love, I love old sewing notions and old sewing items as you know, and I love the graphics, I love the words. So let me put that in here, the video, so you can see what I mean about how these thread papers fit in the drawers. This is a silk cabinet that I have from a general store. I'm not sure how it was outfitted inside. I've just put some of my button collections and other things in there. It's all glass fronted. But I loved, I love the graphics on it. Belding Silks, Belding's Silks. They were a company that sold silks the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s. But I want to take you around to the front so we can look in the drawers. So here's the front. This is what it looks like. And I got really excited after last week's episode because I pulled open the drawers. I never was quite sure. Um, and all of these little compartments, look what fit down in there just perfectly. The thread papers. Now these are from a different company, Brainerd and Armstrong. I am imagining that is exactly what these drawers were created for. This one doesn't have the, the wooden slats, they're gone. Pretty exciting. I think after looking at the blog post, these were probably originally standing on end and you would pull pull out whatever the person wanted the customer wanted and like I said I'm not really sure how that was outfitted if you know I would love to hear from you did it have shelving did it have maybe it had spools by then I don't know so how is how exciting is that this whole thread paper uh, research experience has been so fun and I'm, I'm just thrilled to share it with you and so many of you are as enthusiastic as I am. I am going to, like I said, uh, have offer laid paper, which was the paper uh, used during that time period, on my website in packets with instructions and just a little bit of background history if, if you're interested. So keep, keep that in mind. And now I'd like to share with you the project that I have been planning since last year and I'm just so excited over the top to uh, unveil it to you. Um, I want to introduce you to this project I have been developing and I have pre-recorded several tutorials because uh, because of the instability of my eye, I, I don't I wasn't sure how this was all going to work out. But these all these videos are for the tutorials are pre-recorded for the project. So I'd like to insert here now the pre-recorded launch video that I did explaining to you what this little work bag is all about, this little scrap bag, and how I would like to share it with you. So let me insert that here. Hello and welcome to Susan Stanley's Stitch in Time. On this channel, I love to explore the topics of cross stitch, quilting, 
antique textiles and sewing notions and share my projects. But today is a very special edition floss tube where I'm going to introduce to you a project that I have been working on since last year. Now, as you know from my channel, I named it Susan Stanley Stitch in Time because of my curiosity and love for all the stitching textile world of the past. And this project I want to introduce to you involves looking at the lives of young stitchers and all the skills that they needed to learn for survival. And of course, as you know from watching me, I've been looking at the 1840s. And so this project is going to be centered around the 1840s and I'm calling it First Stitches. And as you know, I've been posting little sneak peeks of First Stitches on Instagram and this project is gonna be so fun. If you are someone who would like to just watch and as we explore this journey together, I welcome you. You're welcome to stitch on whatever you want while, you're, while you listen to the stories and the history of the 1840s and stitching during that time. If you would like to participate, you can participate using contemporary materials, whatever you have on hand, whatever you're comfortable using, or you can join me in using the proximate materials that were available in 1840. And actually in all those realms, we will marvel at how anybody got anything done in the 1840s and at the amount of sewing that was required. I want to take you into the life of a little girl who, that I've created who may have existed in 1840 and we're just going to create a story around the not what we know of people's lives in 1840 from journals and other things that we have available to us and so our little girl is going to be named Mary. Mary was the most common name in 1840 for a young girl in the United States and probably in Europe I don't know that for sure but I'm guessing She's six years old and she lives on the busy Riverport city of St. Louis. Now, if you're a beginner and have never ever stitched anything at all, or if you've never stitched anything other than cross stitch, you are guaranteed success with this project. If you're an experienced stitcher or quilter, and you are very accomplished, but you've never used the most basic tools that were available to people in early days gone by, you also will experience success. And I think you will have a new appreciation for an, a deeper understanding of what it took to get things done uh, in the 1840s. So the goal of the project is we're going to make this sweet little doll quilt together and these fabrics are fabrics that I have curated from my collection and they are from the 1840s time period would have been possible been available to people with ex you know ex fabrics in 1840 and then Mary will also have a label on her quilt and I will explain all of why this is a cross-stitched label. We're going to look into the fabrics. All of this will be explained in great detail through a series of tutorials. Now, why did I pick 1840? You've heard me say it many times. It was a time of great change in uh, the United States and other parts of the world. It was pre-industrial revolution. The factories hadn't, hadn't really come into play yet, so everything was homegrown, made by hand. Why did I pick St. Louis? St. Louis at that time had a lot of excitement, a lot of things going on. It was the gateway to the West. It was not just an isolated little outpost. St. Louis would have had access to goods coming up the Mississippi from New Orleans, possibly things that had been shipped in from Europe would have come up and things from St. Louis would have been going down. So there was this constant flow of goods and services being exchanged. And I think it's fascinating to look at St. Louis because it's interesting 
to, to understand how people arrived in St. Louis. How, did, how would Mary's family have arrived there? Did they come over the Cumberland Trail? Did they come up the Mississippi through Nor New Orleans? We can only know and, and uh, surmise from the journals that people have left behind. So I'd love you to join me on this pilgrimage. It's going to be so much fun. So many of you know that I have taught quilting classes for 43 years. I've been quilting for 43 years and I've explored contemporary techniques and I would just have loved to have a class like this where you learned the history and the background of early stitching and how we have, uh, how we really stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. I have seen countless antiques as being a member of a documentation team and just from loving antique quilts and textiles. And so I have crafted this experience to, based on the reading that I've done, reading from books that were written in the 1800s that were instructional books for young stitchers and, and also pulling from the evidence from the originals that I've seen. And this was inspired from what I know up until this time. Now, why did I want to do this? I think I learned really well by experience and I wanted to, I've had a lot of you ask, you know, could you do something like this? Could you, could you help me get started? And so I wanted to create a project that was meaningful and was a shared experience. You know, Mary um, had simple tools. She wouldn't have had the rotary cutters, the plastic rulers, all the templates, everything that we have today. And I'm going to share through a series of tutorials how Mary likely would have crafted her quilt and uh, why she, she would have done that. This is an interpretation. It's, you know, it's not a full-scale reenactment because we don't all have all the materials available to us today that Mary would have had and we are still, I'm still learning and I think we are still discovering how, how things were done. So it's based on the evidence of what has survived, the antique quilts that have survived and, and what has been written. You know, sewing in all forms was just a basic necessity for survival. It wasn't an optional skill, it had to be learned. Clothing, household items, quilts, all of it was required. And by 12 years old, a young girl could make a shirt, could make drawers, a shift, and she could make baby clothes. And she also had done marking samplers by then, maybe one, maybe more, because she needed the skills to mark the, the linens in the home, the items in the home, all the textiles. She had to show her proficiency with the needle. It just was the way it was. And so we enjoy stitching today, uh, and I think, it's, I think it's valuable to learn from those who have stitched before. We're gonna start at the very beginning, just like Mary would have at six years old. I've built this around to make you successful, we're going to sew patches, just like Mary, was her first skill. And for many young girls, this was their first, first skill they learned with a needle. And their reward many times was a doll bed. And then if they continued to sew and showed proficiency, they would be rewarded with other items for their doll and their doll bed. Um, I would encourage you to try. And like I said, you're welcome at whatever level you'd like. If you have a child in your life who you think might benefit from learning these skills along with you or that you want to introduce, I think this would be a really great opportunity for you to work through this project together. I'm laying the foundation through this project to help you and to build skills so you can move on to more, more complicated quilting projects. You know, really, this is an American settler experience. People in the 1840s, the only things they had were what they could make or someone else had made they could buy. And I've curated kits. And in the kit are 1840s fabrics and 
I will do an unboxing later to share more of what's in the kit. Please email me if you're at all interested. I don't, I didn't curate, I didn't make very many, but I would love to uh, share them with you if you're interested in that. But like I said, you are welcome to, to do this pro join me in doing this project at any level that's comfortable for you, even if that is just observing, if you'd like to observe. You can even use 100% cotton clothing patches from a loved one's clothing. Um, whatever, whatever you're comfortable using, whatever you have access to. Uh, I want to share with you the things that I've learned over a lifetime of stitching that I wish I had learned early on. I want to guide you through this process so you're successful in making your first quilt, if, if it is your first quilt, or in experiencing using these more basic tools that would have been at Mary's disposal. I wish somebody had shared this with me and I would love you to join me. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I love this community and this loving, kind, caring community. I would love to you to share with me what you think, what your thoughts are, and if you think you might want to participate, and what the experience is, is like for you if you choose to join me. Uh, we're going to go on this adventure together. So I look forward to sharing more and giving you more details, doing an unboxing of the kit, and getting started with the, the series and these tutorials. And until next time, make time for stitching. Let's see what's inside the kit for Mary 1840 St. Louis. If you've decided to join me on this journey and you have purchased a kit or would like to purchase a kit, let's see what's inside. Now everything inside this kit has been curated to be as close to what would have been available in 1840 as possible. And our little girl Mary is in St. Louis. She's in a busy port city. She has access to lots of goods. Her mom, her mother is a dressmaker and her grandmother is a milliner, so she has access to lots of sewing materials. So let's see what's inside. The first thing you'll find is an itemized list of all the materials explaining what they are and what they're going to be used for. But I'm going to go over that with you right now. On the top of your package, you're going to find this beautiful postcard. And then you will find beyond the sticker, I'm going to open it up. Brown paper packages. You're going to find a beautiful scrap bag that I made for those of you who are participating and want the kit. It is made with a fabric that would have been available in 1840. It's a drawstring bag. It's fully lined. It has a paper, it has a bottom to hold su your supplies. And it is tied with Petersham ribbon, which was the millinery ribbon available in 1840. Now let's see what's inside. I'll put the box off to this. I'll talk about that in a minute. You'll have three bags. You'll have a large bag, a very flat small bag, and kind of a flat, a small puffy bag. And then inside, you'll have this brown paper package. Now, when you went to a general store or mercantile in 1840, Things were wrapped in brown paper, and they were wrapped in such a way there was no tape. P tape was not used, and they were tied with string. So I wrapped your curated fabric bundle just like you would have received yardage from a millinery store. Now in Mary's bag, she's going to have scraps because she's working from the leftovers from her mother and her grandmother's businesses. So these are the scraps wrapped in a very special way.
When you open your package, you're going to find scraps that I have curated from my collection and from uh, fabrics that I know would have been available in 1840. Some of these are earlier fabrics because, of course, in a scrap bag, you would have fabrics that were being used currently that had been recently cut into a dress, or you would have fabrics that had been worn as a dress or a shirt or some kind of outfit and then were repurposed into scraps. Maybe the dress was repurposed into a child's dress and the scraps were then repurposed into a scrap bag so that you, they could be accessible for things like quilts. So that's the first thing you'll get and you'll have enough fabric in here to make the doll quilt completely. The next thing you'll find is a piece of cross stitch linen and this is because in 1840 we were reaching kind of the tail end of the time when quilts were marked with labels. We're going to talk about all of these things in the tutorials but you will be able to label your quilt either with Mary's name or your own name using this piece of linen. You'll have a piece of fabric that will be for the binding. I'm going to walk you through and help you be successful in this whole entire process of piecing the blocks to putting on the to quilting to putting on the binding and your label. So that's your red is your binding fabric. And then you'll have this fabric for your back. Now each kit might not be exactly the same, but when you see a large piece and it's a bluish stripe, that's your back. And like I said, all of this will be in your letter that you'll, that you'll receive with your kit. And then this is your batting or your wadding. And I'm going to walk you through the entire process of making this quilt and explain how to use each of these items whether you use them from the kit or from your own supplies. All right, so that's the first set of items. In the large bag, we have a whole bunch of goodies. You might say, what in the world is that? Well, I'm going to talk a lot more about this. But this is actually what was used in 1840 to measure fabric. And I could go into a lot of detail, which I will in the tutorials, but suffice it to say, this will be your ruler. It is Bristol paper, which was available in 1840. And this is probably something Mary likely would have had at her fingertips and would have used. She also would have had a Bristol paper square template, and I'm going to explain all of this in the tutorial. This is what she used to uh, create her seam allowance and her stitching line, and I'm going to go into detail on how I learned all this and what I found out. In this bag, you will find a thread waxer and it's beeswax and oh, it smells good when you run your thread through it. You can smell your fingers after. It's... So you'll have that. You'll have this interesting little bag. Now this little bag is a glassine bag and inside of it is one of the most precious items. Pins. Pins were not readily available. They were cherished, they were kept safe, they were kept in a special place, and if you purchased pins, you would purchase them on a roll of paper like this, and it would have been kept in a special place in your work basket so as not to get lost. Now pins were used for a lot of other things besides sewing, but for this we're keeping these in our work basket. In this little package, you're going to find a tin template. Now this template is what we're going to use for marking our 
cutting lines and I'm going to explain all of this in the tutorials and why we use tin and why we use this tiny little wooden pencil. All right, so that's in the first bag. This nice flat bag has a beautiful piece of wool with the three different needles that you will use. And I have described these needles in the opening letter, cover letter, so you will know exactly which needle is the one to use when it's the right time. This is a lovely piece of wool that could be repurposed for a sewing book or, or just kept for an 1840s vignette. All right, and then the last bag contains the three threads that we will be using in the project. We have a cream, a Verisois 103. We have some linen, London Dairy Thread, 50, 30, 53, and then we have another Averisois 5014. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not 5014. 779. <laughs> 779. So those are the three threads you'll be using and the three needles. And then in the bottom of the box, you may have noticed when I pushed it aside earlier, you will have a cross-stitch card that will give you some numbers and letters that probably were available, likely were available for cross-stitch at that time to stitch your label. All right, so now you've seen what's in the bag. Let's start on the stitching. All right, so as you can see, I'm just over the moon excited to share this historical experience of stitching like a young child would have learned in 1840. Uh, this project does also include thread papers because that's what got me all, that's how I uncovered this whole piece of information was in my research about how, how stitching was done. So it's been in the works, like I said, since last year. I do have a limited number now of these work bag kits that contain the 1840s scraps and the tools of that time period so that you can make your own doll quilt as closely to how it was done in 1840. We're going to explore and use the fabrics and the tools and the techniques of that time in this series of tutorials that I've put together. Now, of course, you are welcome, like I said, you're welcome to use your own supplies. You can use contemporary tools. You can use a sewing machine. You can use modern techniques. You can do whatever you want. You can cross stitch while you listen. You can knit. I would just love you to join me and be a part of, of experiencing this little snip in this little window into how things were done in the past. Now, if you have a child in your life, this would be a great opportunity to help them learn their first stitches because this is how children learned um, in the past. So this is really a twofold endeavor. It's learning to piece and quilt in an 1840s style and it's also learning about Mary's life. And so the way I'm going to put all that together is the weeks in between my floss tube I will launch I will release a tutorial on Thursday or Friday and then on that weekend I am going to have a stitched stories time of uh, coming together with your project. I'll be stitching, you can be stitching and we're going to talk a little bit deeper about Mary and her life and the world around her and the tools and the materials and the experiences and the setting of St. Louis, Missouri in 1840. And so it'll just be a very informal time of stitching and I wish it could be two-way, 
it will just be me talking, but please talk back to me and send me comments and uh, just, you know, if you like to have some somebody with you in the room while you're stitching, this is a perfect, a perfect opportunity for that. Uh, like I said, this is all based on the research and the reading that I've been doing. Uh, I've uncovered so many interesting things and I, I really am so excited to share it with you. There will be hashtags and I would love you to post your work. If you're doing this project, if you're using the kit, if you're using your own materials, in whatever way you are approaching this experience, I would love you to use the hashtags. And the hashtags are first underscore stitches, they are hashtag hand piecing, and hashtag hand sewing is fun. And I will link all those hashtags below. Let's get some of this out there so we can show each other what we're doing. I would love to see if you're doing this with maybe using a loved one's clothing scraps. I would love to see how that looks and what you're, what you're doing because we're all so inspired by each other's work. Um, so thank you, for, thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. It has been such a joy and I've been bursting at the seams and, and here now it's finally, it's finally here and I'm able to, to tell you all about it. So you're probably wondering now, how is all of this going to work? How do I access one of these scrap bags? You can always message me if you have questions, but I have a website and as of this video, it should be up and running. It is www.susanstandleystitchintime.com. And please visit the website. I have other items on there. But that is where you'll be able to access a kit if you're interested. And if there's a limited number of these kits, and if the interest exceeds what I planned, I'll see what I can do to make more. I would love and anyone who wants the kit and wants to try these methods from the past, I would love you to be able to use them and have access to that. So the kits will be available on the website on June 22nd at 8.15 Seattle, Washington time. So check your local time difference and plan accordingly. And that's how you will get your, that's how you will get your work bag or scrap bag kit if, if you choose to go that route. Okay, so that's June 22nd, but now the website is open uh, as of this recording and there are some exciting items on there that I know some people have been really patiently waiting for and I thank you so much uh, we tried we tried selling Lou and Sue folios through um, email and that was working fine but once the website started being developed it looked like that was just going to be a much easier way to go so we kind of put those sales on hold, but now we have some to offer to you. And so we have a limited number, of course, as always, of a collection that we're calling the Jean Collection. And of course, this is in honor of Jean Lee of the Attic. So there would be folio and project bag sets, and the folios are made out of this fabric. I'll insert a picture here. Those are available on the website, and then we have just a very limited quantity of a Kids at Play sets. And one that's checkerboard. So things will be be working now through the website and I will let you know as new things are listed especially if there's new project bag folio sets or just folios that stand alone uh, because I know there are a lot of people who are enjoying their folio and and there are people who would haven't haven't purchased one yet and would like one 
So there will, there will be more coming, I promise. And thank you again for those of you who have been so patiently waiting. And um, we do plan to make sure everybody who wants one gets one. And now I'd like to celebrate having reached 5,000 subscribers. And never did I ever dream that that would happen. And I am beyond thrilled, mostly because I'm just delighted that there are that many people who are interested in exploring this journey with me and these topics. Um, I look forward to hearing from you and interacting as we go down other paths of learning and uh, journeying with our stitching. So to thank you, I'd like to offer five, five small giveaways that are from my heart. Um, the first giveaway, each giveaway, and you know the rules with giveaways, right? You have to be 18, year old, 18 years old because I'm going to ask you for your address. You have to be a subscriber and you can't say giveaway or gift because that attracts all of the bots and people who go in and sabotage websites and YouTube channels. <laughs> Everyone, every gift will have three spools of linen. They're in varying colors and varying weights. And you might be saying, well, what in the world do I do with the linen? This is linen thread or linen floss. Linen thread is um, amazing for hem stitching because of course you're using the same fiber as your linen that you stitched on. And so there's three colors. Linen is also really fun for um, embellishing wool applique or even embellishing using it as a big stitch on a quilt if you're, if you're someone who likes to do that. So I would just encourage you if you if are interested in trying. It's, um, it's a beautiful thread and uh, so every packet will include that. And then there are five different packets because we have 5,000 subscribers. And the first packet will be called quilt, the quilt packet and you just need to use the word quilt and in that packet, you will receive a quilt journal, a charm pack, and of course the linen thread. So that is quilt. There is a winter packet with, of course, the linen and three charts. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these charts. Some, and maybe some other surprises will be in there, but that will be the packet. And if you are interested in that one, you need to use the word winter. The next one will be spring. You'll get your linen threads and some spring charts. And the last one, of course, is fall, and you'll get linen threads, and the keyword is fall. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, fall, it's not the last one, but fall, you get your linen threads, and then a few charts, this one's not really fall, but I thought it looks fall-like, so the keyword for that is fall, use that in your comment, I will use the random comment picker to um, decide who, who gets them, and then, the la and then the last one is summer, you get your linen, and then two beautiful charts that are that remind me of summer, so. Okay, I'm so excited. This has just been welling up inside of me, and so I'm so excited that I was able to share it with you today. Please let me know what you think, if you're excited about the project too, and uh, think you might join along with me. I'd love to hear from you. Next time, it will be back to uh, looking at my whips, taking a look at some quilts and doll quilts and talking a little bit about that, a little more work basket history and a little bit more of a look into work baskets in, in this 1840s time period and anything else that I uncover that I find interesting. I'm hoping to prep another Civil War bride block and maybe I'll even have something prepped for it on a new project, but hopefully more 
progress on my on my whips. Thank you again for joining me and until we meet again, make time for stitching.